Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with newly crowned Spaghetti Western expert. Michael. Yeah, go figure. And uh, oh, how the tables have turned. Yeah. We have a double feature we're doing we today. We do. Would you care to elaborate on that? Yeah, we're going to do... Uh, so last time we did a Spaghetti Western with a Japanese movie. This time we thought we'd mix it up, and we're going to do a Spaghetti Western with like a Japanese movie. So we're going to do... Django and Sukiyaki Western Django. Okay, so I'm already confused because the titles. First of all, there's a D in Django. Yes. Is that's a silent D? No, I <laughs> the D a is silent the Japanese D is for D. killing the sheriff. You just throw it at the sheriff. All right, so it's a utility D. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that makes sense. The thing I don't get is one is called Django, one is it a sequel? What's happening here? Well, that would be spoiling it. And do we do spoilers in the intro, or do we just talk about spoiling the movies? I think we in the can intro? only spoil other movies in the oh, intro. Okay, cool. So we'll talk about how it turns out Bruce Willis was Django the whole time. Thank you. Oh, it's been so very long. Um, I think there's going to be spoilers. There's definitely going to be spoilers, right? I don't know. I don't know enough about these two movies right. to know if I can spoil them. You sat. At this point. So we should point this out. You sat absolutely fixed to the screen for both of these films. I did. My notes for the second one literally just say, Japan, ask Michael. Oh, I have the answer. (laughs) I'm not sure. Well, fuck. We're going to spoil both the movies. You can use chapters to skip over Django. Or, uh, you know, go ahead and watch Django, because maybe it'll help you understand. I'm going to try it for the first time here. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Sukiyaki Western Django? Way to go. Sukiyaki Western Django. Hey, look at you. Um... That's the second one. That's the second film. So maybe if you watch the first one, you'll understand the second one a little mm-hmm. bit more. If you're feeling adventurous. There's definitely just, one or two things that will make more sense. Yeah, you, you need it for a couple things. Uh, we're going to go ahead and spoil both of those. Use the chapter, skip to the second one, or skip to the end, and we'll figure out what the fuck we're doing next time. Hey, sounds like a great time. I promise it'll be an amazing time. So during uh, Fistful, you remember way back, uh, I don't know, a month ago, When we did Fistful of Dollars and Gojira. I do remember that. And the promise was to have more Sergio Leone stuff and more Kaiju stuff. Yes. That is clearly not today. No, no, it's not today. However, uh, I kind of had this feeling afterwards that, you know, we described the Sergio Leone movies as Spaghetti Westerns, which Mm -hmm. is accurate. It is accurate. And we described Spaghetti Westerns as exploitation. Absolutely accurate. However, the Sergio Leone movies don't really feel like exploitation. There's a lot of things. Yeah, you're right. They don't. They're too classic, I think. There's Yeah, exactly. I think Fistful of Dollars had too much class. It was too too delicate of a movie Mm -hmm. to feel, to really make sense as exploitation. When we get to Django, I mean, and now we, get to Django. we are talking about exploitation in its finest form. Mm-hmm. We are bringing on the grind with this movie. That's right. And you see that right from the beginning. Yep. We kind of get a group almost. It, it seems like it's going to be a rape, but instead it's more of a lashing. And then there's a bunch of shooting going on. Yeah. The film's certainly more violent, more gory. Oh, yeah. Uh, than anything we're used to seeing in, you know, the Leone stuff. Or even a lot of exploitation up Mm -hmm. to that point, especially the Spaghetti Western. Sure. You know, we talked on that Fistful show about the convention those movies uh, very often follow. And part of that convention doesn't necessitate violence. I mean, it does in the way that I suppose they're shooting each other, but everybody falls down and it's pretty comedic. And it adds to the, you know, the kitsch value we get from that stuff today. There's a lot more of the clutching of the wounds and a dramatic fall when you die in a Leone film. Whereas in this kind of stuff, apparently you don't clutch your wounds. You no, clutch somewhere where you're not bleeding to show that you're bleeding. <laughs> right, that's right. Well, so then you have the gore. You have um, a little bit of mud wrestling. Starts to feel like Russ Meyer yeah. era exploitation. And uh, you know, I think it's even comedic at times, especially the very beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Part of that's the dubbing. But just something about the words they're saying. It's not just the fact that it's dubbed. But the script, what they're reading, yeah. it almost seems like, why did you even bother at yeah. that point? You know what I mean? very true. You know that they had to go in and actually sit down and read that stuff. And at that point, I mean, if you're on the set and you're just all fucking around and, hey, we're going to beat you and don't you like it when you get beat instead of burned, yep. uh, we're going to burn you instead. It's fine because you're all just there on the day mm-hmm. showing up and doing the stuff. But when you actually have to come in and, oh, this is the part where I describe the burning instead of the beating... It kind of seems a little fucking pointless. Yeah. 
Oh, what's going on with these subtitles in particular? Or not subtitles, but <laughs> yeah, the dubbing. It's rather. dubbing. Well, uh, so it we, is exceptionally bad. It's right? terrible. I we I had hate a to always pick out the dubbing in yeah. these movies. Yeah, but uh, what what the fuck? I don't know the actual story with why the dubbing is so bad. I'm my guess, honestly, is that nobody in the movie actually spoke English. That's so they possible. had to get a bunch of voice actors to come in and do the other roles three weeks down the line, maybe four weeks down the line, way separated from the actors having done the roles. People forget what it sounds like. My There's they, really thousands of reasons right. that could have caused I'm probably thinking, all thousand of yeah, them are, are what led to this. They shoot the film, they start putting together the Italian print, they strip the audio, they send it to America, get lost in a mail room right four weeks later somebody finds it goes i don't know what anybody's saying <laughs> sure <laughs> and so they just dub the lines over what people's mouths are moving sure especially some of the um some of the mexicans yeah and the laughter that just sometimes gets stuck in when oh, a person's God. mouth is left agape yeah right it's really really awful I'm, I'm thinking back to a couple of the times that uh people were saying stuff that was very instantaneous very mm -hmm. momentary and they had a full two sentences right. that came out. She's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Uh, from something like, wow, to she's pretty. And there's clearly, I mean, if you're watching the movie, you could maybe, you see this in the dubbing sometimes where they rush the line a little bit. Mm -hmm. They try and make it all fit in the mouth. Nobody knows what was going on there. You know, the day of shooting, we got excited. We were talking really fast and now it's hard to do in post. And you can see that rush sometimes. But here it's literally, fuck, what did I say there? Yep. I can't figure out what I said. Well, the paper says I should say this. Yeah. And they don't even make an attempt to say it very quickly or to slur it or they just read what's on the paper uh -huh. and paste it in. Yep. So I made a I made a observation that maybe Django would be better if it were subtitled. However, it would totally pull away from the grit factor. Yeah, no, there would be no grit if it were subtitled. Yeah, but you would have to have it in Italian. And that would really only benefit us because then People who speak Italian would know just how fucking bad the dub is. Right. And we would just be paying attention to the subtitles and, uh, you know, missing out on the grit. That's true. On the, uh, on the grit that's on display on the screen. You know, when somebody whips open that coffin, I mean, you want to see what's inside. You don't want to be reading goddamn subtitles. And the other big thing, I mean, the, the one line tag to Django is the fucking gun. Yeah. The coffin. I mean, the coffin and then what's inside the coffin. Yeah, it's definitely high concept. Yeah. It's a man carries around a coffin. What's in the coffin? Turns out there's a giant fucking gun in the mm -hmm. coffin. Big spoiler. Giant fucking gun. And uh, and that's really what the movie is centered around. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of what Sergio Corbucci does in all of his films. So mm. this is Sergio Corbucci, not Sergio Leone. Pure coincidence. Sergio Corbucci is far better known for being violent, for being grittier, for being really the exploitation hand in spaghetti westerns. Sure, sure. And a lot of his films follow the high concept formula of a gunslinger who. Oh, right. So this is almost a, a kind of mad lib at this point. Yeah, pretty much. You, a gunslinger you, who carries around a coffin with a mysterious weapon. This is the poster child for Sergio Corbucci films. Sure. But he's also done a gunslinger who is going blind, a gunslinger who's actually a Navajo Indian, right, right. a gunslinger who decides they're going to restart the Confederacy. Sure. A, a twist on the classic gun. Right. Do, are there more? I'm sorry. Yeah, there is. To so you. that was oh actually, there's, there's another one and, and the name escapes me right now. Um, it's, uh, it's a gunslinger who has a gold gun and only shoots it when he knows he's going to make money. So Django is probably of those the the uh, the lowest concept <laughs> film, right? right? Because right. it's not a single end to the sentence. It's a mysterious. It's a mysterious coffin weapon, with right? A gun. I guess it could be a gunslinger who carries around a coffin. There has to be more. That has something in it, right? Uh -huh. You can't just say a. I guess a. Um, no, can't do it. Yeah, this is a very complicated film by the Corbucci standard. Right. <laughs> the other thing that really struck me with that exploitation stuff is how fucking dirty this print yeah, is. Yeah, it is. And we're not watching some weird streaming piece of shit found it on the internet. YouTube. I mean, we are watching. Yeah, this isn't. Uh, what what was the fucking Rachel Maddow? The uh, McVeigh tapes. Yeah, the McVeigh tapes where we had to watch it on YouTube or uh, Google Video or whatever it was. No, this is something that comes off of your DVD, mm -hmm. and it should be gorgeous. And instead, it looks like they didn't even bother with it. It looks like we're in a theater in 1966, and somebody's like slowly hand cranking the whole right. thing with one hand and eating a really sloppy sandwich with the other. Yeah, it's um, it's mostly stuff that was you know obviously at the time of shooting. 
you know, it's stuff like dirt on the lens, mm-hmm. um, especially in those opening frames. But the titles with the too. score, the yeah, the score song. doesn't help at all. Yeah, yeah, it has a black exploitation era theme yeah, song. It kind of this does. is actually Shaft we're yeah. watching at this point. The theme song is amazing because, as you know, I like to correctly know how to pronounce things uh-huh. when I uh, have to talk on my little show dealy here. Uh-huh. And uh, the theme song lets me know that it's. A, yeah. I would have gone to war on right. this. You would have been, oh, it's Django, and I would be like, nope, to Django. Yeah. It's got a, it's got a D. No, it's some kind of weird Italian thing. No, it's Django, like Jillian. Angry emails flooding in still. Um, I mean, but you have it in the theme song, so now we know. Now we know how to pronounce the protagonist's name. Always great. Almost at nauseum. So, <laughs> but I love that song. There's no nauseum here. It's impossible. It's too terrific of a piece. So on top of the dirty print, you almost have, I mean, Grindhouse, the film, Grindhouse, or the films, Grindhouse, Planetary and Death Experience. Uh, made fun of it quite a bit in showing the, the burnt out reels mm-hmm. and the missing reels and things of that nature that you actually got back in these cinemas, in these Grindhouse theaters. But here in the finished print, in the one we're sending off to people who buy the DVD, the actual print fucking sucks. Yeah. It is really bad. And I mean, it's usually watchable, but there are these moments where it just looks like there's water stains yep. all over it. It is ugly as fuck. And so, all right, we are officially in dirty, sleazy, grindhouse cinema. And that's a different place. That is a, uh, a different mood entirely. Yeah. You don't really know what's going to happen in dirty, sleazy, yeah, grindhouse cinema. Yeah, it's really, it's the whole thing about Django is that everything is in excess and you don't know where that line gets drawn. Right, right. It makes the Leone stuff seem safe by comparison. Yeah. For me, the first time I saw Django, which I should mention since seeing Fistful of Dollars, which was at the time my first spaghetti western film right. i've seen every spaghetti you went western insane film about, I in think, existence i think i actually stopped the um the kaiju run and yeah you, you need to immediately be paused so we could do a spaghetti western yeah. run so about how many of these fucking things have you seen i now? think i've seen 20 or 25 that's pretty good for spaghetti westerns. yeah there's a they, lot of them. there is a point where they just get obscure and shitty yeah where they were just easy to crank out mm-hmm. and they don't even have that kind of factor that kaiju did where it's really really funny and instead, the same just, thing keeps coming back. Instead, they just get really, really dusty. Yep. And there are more and more tumbleweeds. Mm-hmm. And fuck that. Just yeah. fuck that shit. So 20 is a pretty fucking good amount. But Django was the first one I watched or shortly after uh-huh. um, Fistful of Dollars that we did on right. the show. So I'm thinking all spaghetti westerns are Sergio Leone movies where they're two and a half hours long. And everything is really slow and paced and everything's in wide angle shots. And then immediately zooms into a ridiculous close up of the character. Their eyes twinkling like they're just about to cry, but they're clearly enraged by some deep, meaningful problem that you don't find out until the last moment of the film. So imagine my surprise when he flips open the coffin. And I'm honestly at this point, I'm like, that's his daughter. That's his yeah, dog. Right. You know, something has in this coffin that means a lot to him because all spaghetti westerns are about people who have deep rooted emotional problems. They are literally carrying their baggage. They're carrying their emotional <laughs> right, baggage exactly. in, a, in a physical manifestation. But instead he flips open the coffin. Hey, pop tart machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And he mows down 48 guys who are all. So this is another thing that I love about the movie. Bad guys, red guys, red guys, kill them. Bad yep. guys are red. Easy, nice and easy. So you get that Gatlin gun, and it's so badass, it's literally a plot device. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that he has a Gatlin gun, everyone else stops what they're doing in the movie. They stop the warring conflict between two sides and the brothel they're running and whatever, and they go... Oh, Gatlin gun. That's pretty sweet. How do how do we get one of those? Yeah, what do we do about that? And so he becomes a door to door salesman. I mean, this is the beginning of Edward Scissorhands at uh-huh. this point. This is what we're watching. Right. He's pulled up in his pink car and he's selling Gatlin guns to the warring factions. So they just want to find out how to get Gatlin guns and he wants to get paid for it. And then we have the typical spaghetti western everybody is a fucking asshole mm-hmm. whether they're chopping off ears or feeding people ear- what the fuck feeding people ears? yeah that was a very contested moment of uh that film you know what i love the most about that is uh this is not the first ear chop we've seen on double Feature. no it's not it is probably the first ear chop we've seen chronologically it is the first ear that's, feed and yes, that's really that's all true. that matters but the thing I love is how nonchalant it is. Yeah. When we saw the last ear chop, I'm going to go ahead and say it's in a Quentin Tarantino film. Mm-hmm. We'll go that far. Um, it but was, not the next one we're about to see on the show. I mean, it fucking, oh my God, there's going to be some Quentin Tarantino today. I forgot about that. 
it it hurt. It hurt, and there was screaming and blood, and it was bad. In this movie, we cut off the ear, we feed the guy the ear, and he looks pretty fucking inconvenienced by yeah. this. Yeah. He looks really <laughs> mad that he had to eat that ear. Even when he falls over and his ear is still clearly there, he looks pretty pissed about it. Not in pain, but inconvenienced. All right, so Frank Nero's character is going to help trade this, this Gatlin gun in for gold. Which, as an aside, is that even a good deal? Uh, the I Gatlin gun that we've seen, he can pretty much do anything on planet Earth now that he has this gun. He can get away with all of it. He's going to train it for a box of gold. Well, the thing about Django is that apparently all he wants to do is not be Django. Uh, really, all he wants to do is have gold. Oh, sure, sure. Because he's a pretty, pretty much just a greedy man right. who has no interest in anybody else's life because he's a cowboy. So how would you contrast that to Clint Eastwood's character of the man with no name that at the time we clearly said was also kind of a fucker? Yeah. I mean, that guy, you know, he, well, I guess I shouldn't go through the plot points of that mm-hmm. movie. That's kind of spoilerish, but he's a dick yeah. and he doesn't really seem to give a shit about right. anybody. Well, the, the evolution of that character throughout the rest of that trilogy, mm-hmm. that movie, it's still a little kind of iffy. A little iffy. But as we go through the film, and and by the third one, turns out he's the good in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I he's mean, literally the good. And it comes out that he's actually a pretty damn nice guy, whereas every other cowboy in every spaghetti western has some fucking agenda. Yeah, right. And that's all they care about. So I don't know exactly where it is, but somewhere around where the coffin, now full of gold right. and dirt, falls into... I know the dirt makes you crazy. Drives when me you nuts. Get, Why do they dump the gold out? When you get dirt in your... Because when you have a giant pile of fucking gold, I don't think you care if there's dirt in it. Okay. You can pay people to remove the dirt all at right. that point. Fair enough. You're all about efficiency. Don't waste your gold. So it falls in the quicksand. I hate quicksand. I don't think it exists. There was uh, an episode of that show we always reference on this show about Lost. quicksand, but I don't know. That's a show we don't ever need to talk about again. So glad they canceled that after season three. Another three seasons could have been fucking disastrous. No, uh, Mythbusters. Oh, right, that. Still going strong, by the way. Yeah. Not yeah. canceled after season three. There's a Mythbusters on Quicksand. So I don't know if Quicksand actually exists. I don't either. Uh, but if your your coffin of gold falls in Quicksand, which I'm actually I'm just going to say doesn't exist until someone tells me otherwise. Double feature show at gmail.com. Once again, you have all the gold, right? I mean, you can pay people for this. Mm -hmm. Can't you just scoop out the tiny puddle of quicksand scoop by scoop until you get to the gold? I mean, they act as if the gold is lost for fucking... That would have been my first move. I would have said, fuck, you drop the gold in there, now I have to get some of the unemployed people hanging out back at the fucking town with nothing to do and pay them to scoop quicksand out fist over fist until I get to my gold. But no, they just abandon, oh, quicksand, that's inconvenient. Well, no, what ends up happening is he goes, no, my gold, that's all I care about in the world. Right. And he dives into the quicksand right after saying, I can't love you, get away from me. After making Maria cry. Yeah, and then he gets his hands trampled and he gets pretty much fucked up and he loses. He's a a total asshole at that point. Yeah, and you don't give a shit about him. He's a greedy jerk. And he gets his hands trampled by a bunch of horses. So this isn't normally how this dynamic is supposed to play out. What's supposed to happen is that he's kind of a bad guy, but then you see him get his hands trampled and you sort of feel a little sorry for Mm -hmm. the bad guy. He's down on his luck and you have a natural human urge to just want to help him. But instead, eh, we don't really know how we feel about him. He's looking up from his hat and he's kind of a badass and whatever. We're okay with this guy. Then he gets his hands trampled and somehow in that moment... You know he's a miserable fuck. He totally deserves that. Yeah, why is that? Just And the more you see his hands trampled, the more you're like, good, fuck that guy. Yeah. That guy's a dick. And then at the end, his hands remain trampled and everybody dies. And uh, he gets to, I guess he gets a little bit of revenge for what happened to him. Sure. But it's not the kind of revenge where we feel like, ha ha, he is fully event. It's Yeah, <laughs> he's he, not triumphant. He takes somebody out and now uh, that's it. Like, now what? Basically, no, that no happens, and he goes, he goes, he has no gun, no hands, and nothing to do. <laughs> you might have to watch one of the 10,000 unauthorized sequels to uh, find out. I don't know if you've ever seen any of them. I haven't, really. I, when I talked about the awful westerns that exist, mm-hmm. what I'm talking about is the 10,000 right. sequels to Django. Right. Uh, some official, some not, but it was just some kind of trend to make sequels to this movie unauthorized sequels um i don't know if it's in the public domain or how they got away i think people just ripped it off yep i think they just used the word django and tried to sell it's a name fucking movies fortunately the movie's a name only one of these django movies was surprisingly made by takashi Miike. that's right 
So this is um, Sukiyaki Western Django. I'm going to keep saying it softly okay. and build up to the Sukiyaki Western Django. That's the one. I think I can do this. Mm-hmm. I think I'll be all right with this. Um, it's Italian or Western or no, Japanese or that's the Quentin one. Tarantino. I yes, that too. I have no idea what I've... This is the most I can bring is correctly pronouncing the name of the well, film. Well, no, because apparently what you can bring that I can't bring is I know, I know nothing about Takashi Miike. Oh, okay. So this is interesting. So I've only seen one Takashi Miike film. Okay. And Other I'm, than this one or including no, this one? No, just this one. Okay. I, oh, actually, I've seen Audition, which I believe is one of his. Oh, I've seen that too. I didn't is know Is that, that was one his. of his? See, I, I actually it's Japanese, know nothing about probably. it. probably. Oh, my God. So <laughs> I was going to go on this big excursion to watch. All, I wanted to just marathon all these films. And I looked up a giant list of every Takashi Miike film. And the list is giant. <laughs> it is really giant. Um, he has more movies he's made than there are sequels to Django. Wow. Yeah, there's a fucking lot of them. But I decided, rather than get super pumped up for this show and learn all my Miike stuff, uh, what I'd rather do, because ultimately this show is about accessibility. There's Mm -hmm. lots of films out there that deserve to be seen, and people are kind of afraid of them because Mm -hmm. of that shit. Right. So I would rather come on here, and I'm now going to start a Takashi Miike journey, and this is going to be my first one. And for a lot of other people, that's probably the case. And you know what? If you already know all your Miike stuff, then you probably don't give a shit what I would say, you know, in that case anyways, from a a week-long excursion into finding everything he's ever done. So you're not alone, first-time viewers. So here's what fascinates me about this guy. It's rare that I'm interested in a filmmaker before seeing anything they've done. And by rare, I mean that basically never happens, because why would you be interested in that? All they do is make films. If you haven't seen any of their films, you don't know if you like their stuff. However, this is a weird guy. He's only been directing since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. We're going on uh, 20 years of Takashi Miike stuff. And in that 20 years, he has an unbelievable amount of directing credits. Mm -hmm. He started working on some TV stuff, some stuff for video. But once he moved to films, and I guess he still does some of that stuff sometimes, he has something like 50 films. I kid you not, 40 or 50 of these different things, which I believe are all full length. We're talking movies like Sukiyaki Western Django. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all as well recognized as that, but I mean, you have to be making films at a rate of five or ten a year in order to get that many out. Uh And they have such a wide scope. It seems like one of his interests does lie in horror stuff and uh, in extreme violence, in taboos, in sexuality, Mm -hmm. stuff that we like seeing, you know, in movies. But he also does family films. He does weird stuff for TV. Just to basically say, fuck you, I can. You know, I think after having this reputation for all this extremely violent, gory stuff, he decided to make some family films just because it's funny. Mm -hmm. It's really fucking funny to him. And so he's uh, somebody I never really got into because although I know a lot of people who have very similar tastes to myself, a lot of people whose, um, you know, whose interest in film I really respect, who know a lot more than me, and they all say, oh, Takashi Miku, you got to check some of that stuff out even if you don't like it, just to see what it's about. I never know where to start. Mm -hmm. There's just too many fucking movies. Uh, You know, people say, see Ichi the Killer, but we're doing this on the show. I don't care if this is a bad place to start, as I'm often told it is. I'm going to do this one first, because that's just, that's you got to start somewhere, Mm -hmm. right? So what the fuck is happening here? Sukiyaki Western Django is actually a prequel to Django. Okay. It's a, I mean, it's a self-proclaimed prequel to Django, and it really only, it's really only the title cards at the end that make it a prequel. Sure. But they put it over the score. So, hey, cool, we get the Django song again right. with some Japanese With Japanese singing. singing, as the subtitles say. You made me watch the movie in subtitles because you, you were worried th- I would not understand the accent. It, it's difficult to understand what they're saying with the accents. A lot of the time, I'm not entirely sure the actors know what they're saying. I would say most of the time, I'm not entirely sure the actors know what they're saying. But they definitely know what they're doing in yeah, the film, right. even if you don't. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So basically what goes on is there's kind of this parallel with the War of the Roses Mm -hmm. where there's a red team and a white team. Uh, The red team is the Heikes, the white team is the Genjis, the white team is led by a supermodel, and the red team is led by a guy that looks a lot like the guy on the cover of Ichi the Killer, which you just mentioned, so I'm assuming it's probably the same actor. Fuck it, sure. And they come into a town, they're looking for gold. It's When you break it down, the premise is very simple. Two gangs are in the same town looking for legendary gold and the elders of the town know where it is and won't give it up. Hmm. And so one guy comes into town and he's essentially the best gunslinger anyone has ever seen. And he's going to be 
the last straw on either side for getting the gold. And instead, he's a cowboy, right? right so he's right. a loner. The reason this film is so vast in what's going on is because that's the simple premise. Yeah. But what happens is that it's a ridiculously seamless blend of Western and it's not really Kung Fu. It's it's just a Japanese samurai movie. Almost. Right. They, they say it's the, the step after Samurai Mononofu, but yeah. I don't even know what that fucking means. But it's, you know, it's sword play and it, there's... There's these temples and all the gang members are dressed in really traditional Japanese clothing and then some of it's high Japanese fashion. Yeah, that's also weird too. That's one of those things that steers me away from yeah. Japanese cinema. <laughs> I don't know anything about fashion. Mm -hmm. I used to get in an argument with my ex-girlfriend all the time about uh, fashion stuff because I would just mock her as it not being art. And I mean, it's clearly art, but I just don't understand. Right. You could see the most you know, award-winning, artistically pleasing. I, I'm trying to come up with um, qualifiers here, although award-winning doesn't mean anything for film. But you know what I mean? People, the stuff that people regard as, wow, this piece of fashion is a great, you know, example of fashion is art. And it's, uh, you know, it's a funny hat and uh, some kind of... Swan dress. Yeah, right? I just don't understand it yeah. at all. And Japanese fashion, I mean... Yeah. It's weird. It's really weird and kind of awesome, but yeah. kind of really well, weird. It's bizarre that you can have all of these different... I mean, just speaking from the way people are dressed, there's modern dress, there's old Japanese kind of... The, the you know, I guess what would be of the period, right? Traditional the, the, dress. Right, thank you. And the, then... <laughs> the stuff they mock Yojimbo for. And then Western stuff. Mm -hmm. all, all just kind of spun into the same weave and none of it really stands out it's not, there's no, oh, this is clearly a Western. Oh, this is clearly a Japanese right, right. film. It's, but it's also not to be confused. See, I want to call it an Eastern Western mm -hmm. because that seems like a really neat name that sure. you could call something like this. Why not? However, that was coined in the 70s for um, these Russian films. Really? <laughs> in Russia, the leader at the time was really into these spaghetti Westerns. Mm. But since it was Russia and they kind of have a stick up their ass, instead of just hailing the spaghetti westerns as great films he demanded they use the russian desert for a western film really? but they dubbed it an eastern western which eventually got called an austern austern i've seen the film it's called uh the white sun of the desert or the white sand of the desert or this something is terrifying me because i can already smell i know that this movie is going to show up on our show in a, in a month and <laughs> i'm going to be fucked again but we're in japan right now i'm going to understand takashi mika in a month and you're going to throw some i don't even remember the word austern Austern. But is there just one Austern? I, is there that, that's the only one I've ever been able to find. <laughs> Great. A genre for a single film. Sorry, you're trying to get back to this well, movie. Well, yeah. So we're going to go back to... We're not in Russia with the czars and presidents and Mikhail Gorbachev in Moscow. We're in Japan with Quentin Tarantino. Oh, God. What the fuck? Okay. So here's the thing this movie keeps doing that's just driving me nuts. Uh, at first, I'm thinking, okay, I've seen Django. I'll understand it more. But then when you, you just mentioned it being a prequel or something, that's mostly for jokes at the end. It's kind of a misnomer. It just makes the film more confusing. All that does is makes the film more confusing. Yeah. You understand a few things, but it kind of opens up really, this whole new the, thing for you to The try only and thing out. you understand is you see the grave go through the sheriff. <laughs> yeah, what? And instead of going, what the fuck was that? You go, why the fuck was the grave from Django in right, this movie? Right, right. And so that doesn't help me a whole lot. And then I'm thinking, oh... Quentin Tarantino. I kind of get Quentin Tarantino. You know, I think I have an okay handle on that. I really love the Kill Bill stuff. Who doesn't love the Kill Bill stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Quentin Tarantino will come into this movie and help explain it to an ignorant Western audience of one, which is me. That doesn't happen. At no. All. He puts on a Japanese accent. Oh, God. And then eventually ends up in a mechanical wheelchair. In some kind of cyberpunk wheelchair. Mm -hmm. it, old, really old, with some bad makeup and some bad acting. I think it's good makeup and bad acting. That mm -hmm. might be what That's that is. That's probably what it is. And uh, again, I just feel like Takashi Miike is thinking, Quentin Tarantino, this is really funny. I don't even know if Quentin... No, Quentin Tarantino gets it. Right? Yeah, he's totally... He totally it. gets it. I don't get it at all. And there's a really Quentin Tarantino moment shortly after we see him Just in, the, one? in the old man wheelchair. Well, yeah, the kind of the, the setup intro for Bloody Benton. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. We, it's, it's the Hugo Stiglitz thing. It's the um, in all the Kill Bill movies, everybody gets their title card and their right, right. here's who's fighting now. Sure. That's what happens with Bloody Benton. 
And that's a very Tarantino-esque thing. But the rest of the film, you know. That's right after he gets mad about his meal, right? Right. Which is far after he cuts an egg out of a snake, a CG snake that's flying through the air. We should probably address this weird violence thing, right? Yeah. Because I don't know if this is a Takashi Miike thing. This is one I of the things I would imagine it is. If Audition and Ichi the Killer are both... We're just naming movies <laughs> from Japan now and saying that they're Takashi Miike films. Yeah, sure. Why not? But uh, if those are both violent, and so then thusly, so must be this film. Well, it's not just the violence, though. It's a very weird, it is. specific kind of violence I'm not used to seeing mm-hmm. anywhere. It's uh, it's almost slapstick. I guess the right word is cartoonish. Yeah. It's Bugs Bunny violence. Yep. It's, um, you know, the color and the saturation are part of it. Everything is really, really bright colors, especially the fucking flashbacks. Uh-huh. Washed out bright colors. But the violence itself, these you know bright reds, goes right along with this uh, this red army and their high fashion red hair and you know all of that. You get the colors, you get the uh, more so. I think the sound effects adds to the cartoonish nature of it. But also the violence itself. You know whether it's the hole in the chest that the arrow goes through. Yeah, that's, dang. I mean, it's comedic. It's violent as fuck, but it's comedic. It's the kind of thing. You would see in a modern American horror movie, sure. you know, wow, that guy just got a giant hole blown through his chest. That but guy's the fact got a you, sword in his forehead. Right, right. But he's clapping. He's clapping, right? It's always, wow, that's really fucked up. And also a little bit funny. Just a little bit funny. Arrow through there, the clapping, just a little bit funny. Whether it's the clapping or getting folded over backwards mm-hmm. and drugged by a horse. I mean, all of the violence in here. The creators of this movie have perfected this kind of badassery. That is, I mean, that seems to go hand in hand with the fashion for me. Mm -hmm. It's Japanese high fashion and complete badass. They know how to look really good in the fashionable clothes they've built. How to boomerang bullets. Even Even the act of the violence, even the method of the violence is fashionable. The boss shots of the coats flying around and the way the... Model dude has the sword that he yep. flips around really flamboyantly. And, and you don't... <laughs> he just feels like such a badass. I yeah. just, it's hard to even make mm-hmm. fun of him for or it. Or bad for your ass. You're going to be really mad when I leave that joke don't in there. Don't leave that joke or in there. Or what about the... um the That's totally staying in there, by the way. <laughs> what about the Gatlin gun? So there's another Gatlin gun. There is. There is. I thought for a while we might not get it, and I was mm-hmm. totally okay with that. Because I was thinking... This is only Django by name, because I didn't know the little kid was right. Django. The little, which is the little Asian boy was Django. Apparently. Also, that kid was totally a fucking liar. He was not mute or blind. Fuck that kid. So, yeah, fuck that kid. But also, we get the coffin with a gun in it again. Right. So, it's a different coffin. It's got to be, <laughs> sure. because the, the kid doesn't take off with the coffin, I guess. Well, you don't know. He might take it. The I coffin doesn't get destroyed. That's true, because the your favorite sheriff is in it. But before we get to him, you want to say that Takashi's gun is better than Corbucci's gun? I really like Takashi's gun. I like that it's giant and it has multiple barrels and it feels so extremely badass. And you know what? Fuck you. I like that you crank it. I, I like, like Corbucci's gun. gun because it, to me, it looks like you just set off a bunch of firecrackers in a <laughs> tube and then it kills people. That's really all that is. <laughs> they didn't have computers back then, right? right? So this kind of violence is a little more serious, but it's also still really cartoonish. And I'm wondering if the cartoonish nature of this stuff, does that make the violence better or worse? Does it make it, I guess better or worse isn't the right term, mm-hmm. but is it, uh, I do, let's talk censorship wise. Let's talk, oh my God, that was really fucking violent and grotesque. Is it less grotesque because it's cartoonish or does that just remind us that Also, cartoons are fucking violent, and we give those a free pass. I think both. I think it's both less grotesque, and it's commenting on that cartoons are more violent than we would otherwise think so. And also funnier than we were aware of. Cartoons are funny. That type of violence also lets you get away with doing things you couldn't do. That entire scene of the guy, you know, clapping, right? The clapping. That, That wouldn't have existed at all if it weren't for that type of violence. The whole thing is orchestrated around building up to what is then a punchline Mm -hmm. or the weird moment, you know, jumping out a window and then freezing and then locating the horse mapping over as if you're using the little stick on your DSLR and then showing the horse and jumping onto that stuff like boomerang bullets. I mean, none of this would exist outside of uh, that's the whole style of Mm -hmm. the film. And I wouldn't go as far as to say the plot of the film, like when we were dealing with needing the Gatlin gun for the Uh plot in the last film. But it becomes unrecognizable without that. Entire scenes of the movie need a mission. Now, normally I don't need to defend something like this. Uh 
no one's making the claim that Takashi Miike shouldn't have cartoonish violence or asking what it would look like without it. But I bring it up because there's a moment at the end of the film that uh, you and I have a divide on how we, um, the first time we saw it, how Mm -hmm. we felt about it. And for me, I've just absolutely surrendered everything to this movie. I'm so confused by the style of violence that I've never seen before. Yeah. And while I'm soaking everything in and just completely loving it, I have to be a sponge at this point. Mm-hmm. I can't make any commentary on what the movie's doing. I can't ask myself if it were done other ways or how do I feel about this or is it cheating? So there's a moment at the end where there's kind of a showdown. Yeah. There's the scene in the snow. It's the scene in the snow. That's sure. really the best way. Once it starts snowing, everything that happens until... Yoshitsune dies. Mm-hmm. Essentially... Also a badass. Totally a badass. Everybody, a They're, complete fucking great. badass. It's fantastic. Bibi, a complete fucking badass. Oh my god, such a badass. So we get the the character in black, mm-hmm. and then we have Yoshitsune, and they're showing down Yoshitsune with the sword, the man in black with the six shooter. Mm-hmm. He shoots his six bullets, runs out of ammunition. Yoshitsune splits one of the bullets in half, and then they're locked. Sword to revolver. Mm-hmm. Face to face. And Man in Black goes, ha ha, got another gun, shoots him in the head. <laughs> it is so funny to me. And to you me, know what? When it's funny, then I just go, well, it's funny and that's what the movie's going for. It's a joke. To me, I feel so cheated. Because, you do. Because I feel like Yoshitsune has been like built up as this really seriously good fighter. And he's a total... He's evaded six shots from a revolver right. at point blank right. range. Not dodging... Just stopping them with the sword. Right. And then it comes down to, haha, I have a secret gun. If I could appeal to your sense of the spaghetti western, mm-hmm. the man in black is just an asshole. He fucking cheated, and that's fine. That's true. That's exact. I guess, yeah, that is exactly true. But I just. He just I feel pulls like, a gun out of nowhere. I have a second gun. You're fucked. I feel like there should have been maybe a subtle hamster to prevent the whatever device. A subtle hamster. Just a subtle hamster. So you just wanted uh, him loading up a little sidearm or, or something. Yeah, maybe him showing him loading the Derringer, showing him like reaching up his sleeve in a clicking noise sure. would have been fine for me. Something so, that I could watch and see maybe the fifth or sixth time through the film and go, there it is. That's the moment where they tell you he has a gun up his sleeve. Oh my God. You are now making a call for hamster style in films. Subtle hamster. And our show is over. The uh, website <laughs> is doublefeatureshow.com. The email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I welcome the corrections about anything uh-huh. this week. However, I mean, we put this out here last time, right? We went on the show when we did films, double features, not ready to cover uh-huh. part two. And that's not really what we're doing, you know, right. th- this episode. But we did that last time. Uh-huh. And, some and you fucker, fucked up on your Jimbo. Yeah, well, I fucked up on Kurosawa. And I don't even remember the specific thing it was. But I went on the show and I said, we have no idea what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. At some point, we just have to embrace things and start down the path. Otherwise, we're never going to do them. We repeat the same. That that is kind of, yeah, that is kind of what's going on here. So I welcome the corrections, but don't get really drunk and listen to the podcast at night and fire us off angry emails. And then it's not productive for anyone. You once liked our show, but now we've disappointed every, we disappoint you every week. Fucking face it. I know that always happens. It always happens. I listen to all 130 something episodes of your show, but then you mispronounce that one Japanese thing and I will never listen to this shit again. Yeah. You can also donate. Uh, if you go to, donate.doublefeatureshow.com you can send us some money which would probably go to all the little hissing and clanking and banging you may have been hearing today. Oh my today. god, do you hear all this shit? I don't know what has been going on. They're Apparently renovating they're... every single studio in this whole building right. with the exception of the one we recorded. That's I think what's, what's going on is is they're actually just going to add another floor underneath us and they yeah, haven't right. told us. So we're, you know, a little bit higher today which explains the lack of anything that's made any Oxygen. sense. Oxygen, right. That's really. what it explains. Does and that, that doesn't make any sense at all. It makes perfect sense. So if you donate, not only will you uh, make for better sounding shows. Oh my but God, I want soundproofing in here. The better sounding shows could be a show that you decided. Anybody that donates gets entered into a list of people. Then we're going to pick two people. You guys get to send us some movies. We decide, hey, we're going to put two of them together. And then we're going to do it at the year end here. Yeah. And we'll have to do the movies. Yeah. I mean, they're going to send us a short list. We're going to pick one from each list. And we're going to talk about them on the show. No matter how fucking disastrous it is. Because apparently that's what people want. That's and what you want. I would be amused by that. So we'll just fucking do it. It's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. And we have a cool thing for the people who subscribe on there, which we've already talked about in every episode of this fucking show. Great. 
Next time on the show is some mustache. We're going to do some cars and we're going to do some whiskey. So I'm confused. Is this road exploitation or what's happening here? Oh, that's definitely a conversation for uh, next week. We're going to do Smokey and the Bandit and Thunder and Lightning. Smokey and the Bandit, everyone has seen? Yes. And Thunder and what? I've seen Thunder and Lightning. All right, great. So next week there'll be two people have seen Thunder uh-huh. and Lightning. There were There were at one point three people that would have been seen Thunder and Lightning, but one of them died in a closet in Thailand. Watch more fucking film. Uh, bye.